contrast again. Um, the previous two projects have been uh, very different from each other, and this is going to be different yet again. So uh, my name's John Swagger. Um, I'm an archaeological illustrator. Um, I usually do, or I have done in the past, very ordinary, boring archaeological illustrations, lots of pottery drawing, that kind of thing. Um, but I was the site illustrator out at the Chattel Hewitt project for 10 years. And um, I was encouraged to think of new ways that archaeological illustration could work within archaeology. And I became somewhat frustrated with the way that um, I was being asked to produce material for public outreach, and yet the only illustrations I had were sort of pottery and bone and so on that most people who didn't have an archaeological background couldn't really understand, um, at least not without a great deal of explanation. And so it was that idea that I needed to combine uh, images that non-archaeologists could understand with explanation that really kind of led me towards comics. And so for the past 10 years, I've been increasingly using comics um, as outreach, but also as material um, to illustrate or visualize research. One of my most recent projects has been um, a community comic strip in Oswald Street, which is a small market town about 60 miles uh, south of here. Um, it's uh, right on the English-Welsh border, um, it has um, a Norman foundation, it's full of all sorts of rural and um, borderland uh, heritage and history and archaeology. And um, if you know Oswestry, the name Oswestry at all, it may have popped up on your radar uh, because it has a really nice, well, it has a fantastic Iron Age hill fort. Uh, just on the outskirts of town, Old Oswestry Street Hill Fort. And um, back in 2013, Shropshire Council thought it would be a really great idea to build houses right up against the side of the hill fort. And no surprise, uh, most of the people living in the area thought this wasn't such a good idea at all. Um, and so uh, there was a local uh, community group got together, uh, organized a protest, sent a petition to whoever we send petitions to nowadays. Um, we did things like we had a Hug Your Heritage Day and we all went up there with signs on the hill for it and generally raised uh, awareness of the issue and, and um, sort of brought it onto um, the national and inter international um, scene and um, Shropshire Council backed down, although I have to say not entirely, watch this space. But uh, I got involved in the project, obviously, I, I was campaigning along with everybody else, but I also contributed illustrations. and. I produced posters and so on, and I also produced some um, rather nice, if I say so myself, Gilray-style um, uh, political cartoons. Mary Beard retweeted that, which I was very pleased with. Um, and it really made me think about using comics and using cartoons as a way of drawing attention to local heritage issues, so not just explaining archaeology. But during the course of the whole, whole, whole protest, uh, one of the questions that really kind of bothered everybody was why, why is Old Oswestry under threat anyway? Why is it that this enormous hill fort, which is visible for miles around, um, appears to be ignored? And the reason we came up with was that really the people living locally either didn't know or didn't understand or couldn't get access to information about this hill fort. So they didn't value it. They didn't necessarily appreciate it. But it having been pointed out to them, they were in interested. Um, and I suggested that one of the reasons why uh, local people didn't appear to know very much about Old Oswald Street Hillfort was because that most of that information was locked away in specialist spaces. So it was in a museum, or it was in an archaeological journal, or it was in a history book. Not exactly the kind of places that people go to every day. And so I suggested that we might want to do something different. And I suggested comics. So I approached the local newspaper, the Oswestry Advertiser, Oswestry and Border Counties Advertiser, and I said to the editor, would you allow me some space in the newspaper for some comic strips? And he said, you can put comic strips in my newspaper forever if you want. Local newspapers are really interested in good quality material. Um, and so originally I designed a 13-week um, comic strip series, uh, and that was later essentially a pilot for a whole year-long project um, that HLF funded, which just finished this spring. And every week I produced a four-panel comic that went into the newspaper that talked about some aspect of local history, archaeology, uh, and heritage. And then when the HLF project, um, when I got funding for that, this also included things like doing a town trail, um, doing some workshops, and eventually publishing um, 
the comics as a collected book. Oh, and this conference session really was a commitment to HLF as well, which I probably should have mentioned at the beginning. Um, the comics themselves um, were a really interesting uh, experience. Um, it, when I started the project, I had a big long list of 52 subjects that I thought I should cover. And, you know, it was like the Normans and the Romans and the Saxons and so on. And, and this I duly did. Um, but about a quarter of the way through the project, I began to realize that the comics were changing um, quite in a very interesting sort of way. So the, these, are the, these are the comics that I was originally producing, you know, answering the question, what is heritage as opposed to what is history or archaeology? Informational, they were kind of didactic in a sense. So this is a comic about the Roman marching camp that sits on the outskirts of town, showing the visual context for it, you know, giving people a sort of introduction to the idea that the Romans um, were out there at the, at the side of town. Um, but also that local archaeologists had been involved in excavating this um, site back in the 1970s. These are kind of fairly straightforward, I suppose, informational comics about uh, local history and archaeology. Uh, the comics medium is great. It's, you're able to tell a very complicated story in a very short space of time. But very quickly, uh, because I was producing these comics partly in town, I was sitting in the library drawing them, I was in the coffee shops drawing them, if the weather was nice, I was in the park, I began to get people coming up to me and saying, oh, are you drawing another comic? What, what are you drawing on? Well, I'm going to do it on the medieval hospital. But there was a medieval hospital in town. Where was it? I work in the hospital. You know, I'm a nurse in the hospital now. Where was that hospital? I'd really like to know. And so what I, what I realized as I was drawing these comics and, and began including local people who were talking to me about their interest in the subject that I was covering was that, in fact, I was having a dialogue within these comic strips between people who had an interest in the past and hadn't quite been able to articulate it or express it or kind of pad it out with real information. And so if, I think this is, this is actually comic six, you can see the number there in the corner, but as the comics went on, these people appeared more and more um, as, the series, as the series progressed. And it wasn't just an opportunity to, to tell stories about what somebody's grandfather had been up to or what I found in my garden, although those stories did pop up. It was an opportunity to link the kind of, let's talk about the Normans, let's talk about the Romans, let's talk about the Saxons kind of agenda that I'd had at the beginning with local interest that was actually there on the ground. And so it was making a connection that was waiting to be made. It wasn't forcing a connection on people. Um, and you can do that with so many things um, when you start talking with, with people who aren't uh, professional archaeologists. You get talking to people like reenactors. There are actually an awful lot of reenactors in and around Oswestry reenacting just about everything you can possibly imagine, including the Napoleonic Wars, which didn't happen in Oswestry. Um, but they're very enthusiastic. They're very connected with a whole culture, a whole subculture, a whole culture in its own right, I suppose of reenactment of the Napoleonic Wars that goes across, goes right the way across Britain, right the way across Europe. Um, and they are extremely knowledgeable. I don't know anything about the Napoleonic Wars, and it was really interesting to be taught uh, history um, by a bunch of reenactors, and indeed taught military archaeology by a bunch of reenactors. I felt it should have been the other way around, but obviously that's not, that's not going to be the case. There were corners of local history and heritage which I had never really come across. I was very interested as I went, as, I, as the source series progressed, the number of people that were coming up to me and saying, so what, what's kind of the green stuff behind this archaeology? And it, I, I'd never really appreciated how green most archaeological sites and monuments are, and that they are, in fact, specialist ecological niches for a lot of wild and rare plants and so on. Turns out that all three species of endangered newt are present up on Old Oswestry Hill Fort, so you can't build a house on Old Oswestry Hill Fort. Um, but there were also people like this who were interested in the medicinal plants and the, the native plants that grew on the hill fort. And I went on a tour with Natalie. She took me and another person around the hill fort, and she didn't reference the archaeology once. But we went everywhere. We went all over the the, the, the ramparts all over the ditches and so on, and what she was looking at was the plants, and she almost didn't see the archaeology. She knew it was a hill fort, of course, but that was less important to her uh, than the plants. And it was a real eye-opener for me to see somebody um, not just passionately engaged with some aspect of heritage, but deeply knowledgeable about an aspect of heritage that I knew absolutely nothing about. And this was my site. You know, I'm an, I'm an archaeologist. I should know everything here. Um, there were also these nice little intersections with people's 
accidental encounters with archaeology. So Mark and Rachel, um, Rachel had told Mark to go and dig the garden, and Mark had found this piece of carved stone. And they sent me a message on um, the Facebook page that I had for the, the comics saying, what is this piece of carved stone? Is it anything? Could it be anything? We think it might be a medieval thing. I don't know. And so they brought it along to Heritage Open Days, and I had a look at it, and I was able to tell them um, what I thought it might be, and that it may have come from a really nice Wesleyan chapel just down the road from where their house is that was knocked down in 1967. There are some in fantastic photographs in the Shropshire archives of this beautiful building being churned up into rubble. Um, and then that that rubble was then used to uh, infill the car park at the back of the markets, and their house uh, backs onto that. And they were so taken with the idea that there was stuff in their garden that was actually meaningful that Rachel promptly went off and volunteered at the museum and Mark got all enthusiastic about photographing Victorian buildings around town. It then turns out that Rachel's grandparents, great-grandparents, and great-great-grandparents were all mayors of the town and that she has up in her attic boxes and boxes of material from those mayoral reigns, I'm not sure what they are, but those periods, which she's never looked at, didn't think were important, and kind of said one day, would the museum want this stuff? And there are the pristine invitations and you know all sorts of, of material that the museum was really very interested in, which she would never have offered to them had she not made a connection through uh, this piece of carved stone. And she would not have made the connection through the piece of carved stone if she hadn't got in touch with me thinking that there might be a space for this story in the local newspaper. And I think this is, this is one of the things that I really became, that I, I found out was really important about these comics, was that this was no longer an opportunity for me as an expert to stand on a soapbox and tell the people of Oswestry what they should know about the past. It was an opportunity for people themselves to kind of stand on that soapbox and say, I found this really cool thing in my garden. And then for me to help them and say, right, well, it could come from this, it could come from that. You know, let's, let's both research uh, this particular thing. There are other, other stories that came out. Um, Reverend William Walsham Howe, if you're a church historian, um, was known as the, the bus-going bishop, no, the, the omnibus bishop. He was a really well-known bishop in London. Um, very uh, well regarded by the poor, did a lot of work down, down in London. But before he was that, he was the rector of Whittington, which is just outside of Oswestry, Street, and he wrote hymns, most of which are awful, uh, and poetry, which is even worse. But he was really interested in wildflowers, and he went around his parish and kept a record of unusual occurrences of wildflowers um, through the, I think it was 18 years that he was rector uh, of the parish. And as a consequence, that record um, is now a fantastic uh, manuscript, a fantastic document uh, that preserves a, a record of climate change um, and environmental change from then until now. And um, Birmingham, it's now in the collections of Birmingham University, and it's being used to map changes uh, in the environment around Whittington. The second half of this story, which unfortunately I didn't get a chance to put into a comic, is that the journal only emerged because somebody locally was interested in church history found this thing in the back of the parish register, where it had sat for a hundred years, and turned it over to a local gardening enthusiast, who then published it as a little booklet, and then got talking to me at the Napoleonic reenactment you saw in a um, couple of comics back. So another thing that began to emerge from these comics, and as a consequence of doing them over the course of the year, was that all these different aspects of heritage are networked. It's a whole collection of people interested in a whole collection of different subjects that really do bring out the full story of a place or, or, or a site or a monument or whatever. And that is something I really didn't expect when I started. Um, this network includes professional archaeologists as well. Um, this is Dr. Rachel Pope, who uh, excavated um, Hillfort up in the Clidians, who was very active in the old Oswestry campaign. And so I gave her a space in here to talk about what it is about studying the Iron Age um, that, that so interests her and what, that, you know, what those sorts of questions um, can say to people today, and making the connection between the archaeological, the professional archaeological work that goes on in Hillforts and the volunteer work um, that goes on uh, to preserve and maintain these community sites. So, uh, as I say, because I was drawing these comics uh, in public, um, increasingly so, actually, as I became, as my production became more and more digital, which is kind of an interesting story that comics people, I, I, it's more for comics people, but it allowed, uh, digital production allowed me to, to make the comics in the library, in the 
in the coffee shop, uh, in the park, and as a result, people got interested in making comics themselves, and so I ran a whole series of workshops um, that basically facilitated people telling their own stories or the story of where they lived or, or, or and that sort of thing. And these were great. Again, a lot of really interesting stories came up that I would never, ever have um, found. Um, and it ties into the idea that if you are producing this archaeological informational material in a vernacular context, you are going to hit things that you wouldn't <coughs> otherwise hit. Um, producing or publishing rather the comics in the advertiser was extremely important. Um, it, was, it has a very targeted distribution. It doesn't quite get to Chester, so you can't find any copies here. It doesn't quite get to Shrewsbury, but it does target those people who would know all the, and recognize all the places that I drew in the comic. Interestingly, it gets into about 40% of the households in that area and has a distribution of 18,000 copies a week. Now, I simply cannot imagine being able to distribute 18,000 copies of any piece of archaeological outreach and hitting 40% of the local population in any medium, even radio and television. That, I think this is really crucial, and I think local newspapers, it's a shame that they're going to disappear in a couple of years, but I think local newspapers and other kind of local news media may be an, an extremely important way for us to both use this medium and perhaps do other kinds of outreach as well. Uh, the Facebook page, there was a dedicated Facebook page for it. That was also important, and it created this kind of cycle, this kind of loop uh, that I was talking about, where people would see the comics, think that they were for them, give me information, and then appear in the comics themselves. And that also, that kind of digital version of local news media, um, was really important. And this, this just illustrates the Mark and Rachel story. I did some feedback. HLF wants numbers, and so I did some feedback. Um, the metrics were, were interesting because most people simply had never come across um, information about archaeology, history, or heritage presented like this before, which I suppose I, um, I anticipated. What I didn't anticipate was that 70% of the people, that's this slide here, over 70% of the readers, said that they had gone on to do something else connected with heritage as a result of seeing information in the comic. And that, I think, is a really nice number. 70% impact for any kind of outreach is, I think, really significant. Uh, Heritage Open Days uh, was really useful in um, just kind of making connections with people. There are Mark and Rachel, you can see how accurate or not my drawing of them was. Um, but it then led on to other projects. So um, the fact that the comics were successful, the fact that they had this kind of life outside the newspaper as well, meant that I'm now doing comics about other historical projects in town. Uh, Homefront Heroines is one of them. Um, the, Kind of big heritage conversation we're doing. I'm also doing smaller archaeological comics as well, or smaller heritage comics. This is a part of a series that's appearing in one of those little photocopy, you know, local news newsletters. Um, there is a, I do actually have a copy of that somewhere. I can't see it, but this is an example of the way that you can squeeze a comic into a very very tiny space and and still make the most of the information at your disposal. I mentioned stories that came out of the workshops. Um, there's a fascinating, a really, really fascinating story to do with a nature reserve uh, on the other side of Shropshire, the English side of, uh, sorry, the English side of Oswald Street, the Shropshire side of Oswald Street, where uh, locals were essentially trying to reclaim a piece of common land and found unusual and unlikely allies in all the hippie travelers that were squatting on it. And it's a fascinating piece of social history, which I have not seen written down anywhere. Um, but which the people who were making the comics in the workshop were sort of slowly telling me and slowly piecing together in these illustrations. Um, I don't know whether it'll ever see publication, but it's a fantastic story. And it's, I think it's an example of the way in which once you present people with the medium, um, it kind of takes on a life of its own. So just to wrap up, um, as far as I'm concerned, um, one of the... The uh, one of the nicest summaries I got was a letter that was written to uh, Heritage Lottery Fund by one of the readers of the comics. And it includes things like saying that the comics give uh, local people an opportunity to participate in the heritage of the town. Um, that it takes history, archaeology, and heritage off the dusty shelves of academia or academic speciality and um, encourages them to use the comics as an introduction or a taster to something else. And for me, I think that's really, that really kind of sums up what I did not expect uh, the comics to do. 
in a sense, was really to push people on towards other things. So that's the Oswestry Heritage Comics. Thank you very much. Thank you.